Who is the fig tree generation? Will a fig tree generation, as asserted in this the following video clip by Amir Safati, see the return of Christ? Or perhaps the question we really should ask is, is there a fig tree generation? Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branches has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. That's a parable. In other words, he's not talking about a fig tree. He says, learn from the fig tree. I'm talking about something else. And then he says, so you also, you, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, the generation that can see the fig tree coming back to life, will by no means pass away until all these things take place. This clip represents the central point he makes in the sermon. So what are the assertions that he has made? He interprets the fig tree parable as some special event 2,000 years in the future of Jesus' disciples when the nation of Israel will be restored to its original nationhood. He then says, you, and at that point he points to the people in the audience, are the generation of people who, according to Jesus' words, see, and he points to his eyes, this special fig tree-based restoration of the nation of Israel. And therefore, when Jesus says, this generation, he means the generation of people who are alive to witness the restoration of the nation of Israel, and they will basically be the ones who experience the second coming of Christ. The all-important question now is, is this what Jesus actually said? To assist us in answering this question, Let's first read the passage in all three renditions of the Olivet Discourse that is contained in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. So I'm going to read this in Matthew 24, 32 to 34, and then Mark 13, 28 to 30, and then Luke 21, verses 29 to 32. Matthew. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. We're now in Mark. As soon as its branches, a branch, sorry, becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see, see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass and away until all these things take place. Place. It's almost identical to Matthew's rendition. Now we have Luke. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as you they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass until all has taken place. What are then some of the important questions we must ask to ascertain what is being said here? Number one, these are my suggestions. Number one, what is the parable about? I, what is the central message of the parable? Number two, what was Jesus trying to say when he referred to the parable by the words, so also when you see? 
Number three, what did Jesus mean by all these things? Was he referring to the parable or the events just detailed before launching into this parable? Question number four, what was Jesus' audience, i.e. who was in view with the pronoun you? If we can answer these four questions, we can, I think, quite clearly demonstrate who was in view with the term this generation. So number one, what was the parable about? Safati asserted that the parable is about the restoration of the nation of Israel. In the full sermon, he states that the fig tree is used as a representation of nationhood of Israel as opposed to Israel in a spiritual sense. I mean, you have to listen to his sermon to get the detail he was referring to. I would suggest that he's engaging in eisegesis here. Never mind what the Old Testament says about a fig tree and about Israel in many other different ways. This parable doesn't say any of that. So he's engaging in what I call eisegesis. It simply means reading information into the passage that simply isn't stated in the passage. Since this parable does not say anything about the restoration of a dead tree, as if to say the fig tree died and it was re restored several millennia later, which is effectively what he, it would need to say if it was about the restoration of Israel two millennia later than the words that Jesus spoke, as in the time that he said it. So to re reiterate this, I would suggest he's engaging in eisegesis here since the parable does not say anything about the restoration of a dead tree in the long distant future. Even if Israel was meant with the tree, the rest has to be quite literally imposed into or onto the parable. Let's break it down so we can clearly see what Jesus is saying. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. These were the words of Jesus. So we are to learn a specific lesson from the tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. If we read this in plain English, it simply means two things. When the tree's branches become tender, it puts out leaves. And when its leaves are out, we know that summer is near. Note here that the parallel passage in Luke's Gospel also has the additional phrase, and all the trees. Given that Luke primarily wrote to a Gentile audience who may or may not know about a fig tree, the addition of all trees is a pretty sane giveaway that Jesus isn't making any specific assertion about a fig tree per se, and therefore something specific to Israel, but only that it is just a straightforward and simple assertion that is true of all trees. When trees put out their leaves, you know that summer is near. It's kind of stating the bleeding obvious. This leads us straight into our next question. What was re Jesus referring to when he said, so also when you see? The most straightforward and simple an explanation is that the so does not refer to some special knowledge Jews may have about the restoration of the nation of Israel, but simply in the same way that you can conclude that summer is near when you see leaves on a fig tree, so you can conclude that the coming of Jesus is near when these things have happened. Which again leads us squarely into the next question, namely, what did Jesus mean by all these things? Was he referring to the parable or the events he just detailed in such great, you know, thought-provoking ways before launching into this parable. Again, the most obvious and plain reading is that all these things refers to the long list of events Jesus has just detailed from verse 3 all the way to verse 31. And there are several natural reasons why the context demands this is so. These things is plural. 
whereas the shedding of leaves is one single event, one single thing. If Jesus had meant the shedding of the leaves on the fig trees is the sign to look for, would he have used these things? Never mind would he have said, so look at, but would he have used the term these things as plural to refer to it? And of course, that makes no sense. Firstly, it is a single event, and secondly, wouldn't he have much more naturally referred to it simply as the shedding itself, because that's just what he said? Secondly, and more importantly, it is much more likely that Jesus re was referring to the actual question the disciples had asked, namely what they had said in verse 3. Remember that they originally asked, if you read the whole chapter, when will these things happen in verse 3. The term these things appears not only in the original question, but also at several junctures in the list of detailed events that Jesus gives. Now that depends on the translation of whether some will use the word those things, some will use these things, some will say these without the, attaching the word things, but the context shows clearly what's being said. We see that in verse 6, and we see that again in verse 8, and in several other translations it happens even more often. Whether these or those or these things is used depends, as I said, on the translation, but the context is very obviously pointing to the fact that when Jesus uses this term in verse 33, the these things refers to the long list of events Jesus just predicted. That leads us to our final question of audience. Who was Jesus speaking with? As in, what was the word you meant? Was it Jesus' disciples or some generation in the far future? As Amir Safati intimated. Imagine for a moment you're at the reading of the testament of your mother and father who recently died in a car crash. They've left their will for you, and you're now sitting at the lawyers with your brother and your sister and the lawyers reading the testament to you. There are no special things that go to individuals, but rather the house has been left to all three of you, and the testament reads like this. Now, of course, this is just an imaginary testament. When you read this, this is the reading of the testament, the parents wrote it. When you read this, you will know we have passed and have left the house to you. We don't want you to squabble over the house. Our wish is that you would share the property and each enjoy the gardens and think of us as you cherish its wealth. When you enter the garage, you will find our old car. If you think it is worth restoring after you have evaluated it, please do restore it. Who is the audience of this testament? I mean, the obvious answer to that is the three kids. Is the testament directed to their grandchildren? No. Will the grandchildren benefit from the testament? Yes, in a secondary nature, by the mere fact that they are the grandkids and will naturally go and visit the property and, and benefit from its wealth. So again, to reiterate the audience relevance, who is being addressed just the three kids. Who is to restore the car? The kids. Is the restoration a must? No, it's conditional on their valuation. Does this testament have relevance in terms of actions for a generation two millennia away? I think you know where I'm going with this. If we say that the personal pronoun you that's used many times over in Matthew chapter 24 in various different ways, not always in relevance to the disciples, but certainly in the first 30 verses it is always used in relevance to the disciples of Jesus, as in they are the audience. If we say that that personal pronoun you is not the disciples of Jesus, but some distant generation of people in two millennia away, then I would suggest that words in English have no meaning and you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. Now, I know that's a serious accusation, 
But that is the logical conclusion of denying the audience meant with the word you. So why do people fall into the trap of misinterpreting this passage so badly? I would suggest it is due to the many difficult assertions that Jesus makes that sound so very much like the end of the world, and therefore they feel compelled to find a way out of the very obvious timing passages. I do understand the conundrum that this poses. I have recently authored a book called Did Jesus Predict the End of the World? And it is primarily just about the Olivet Discourse. It is being published in a few weeks, and I intend to publish it piece by piece on my podcast so you can listen to it for free there. It's reformedapologist.substack.com. I will add it to the video description. I sure hope that some of my listeners will support my ministry by buying the book once it's published. Just one final comment. Many today believe that the word generation in this verse should be translated race. I, the Jewish race, will not pass until all these things take place, thereby, thereby giving themselves a get-out-of-jail-free get card in order to say, well, this passage can be something about the future and not back then. This is yet another of the many questions that I answer in my book. The short version is, as in the short answer, is the Bible gives us no warrant to translate the word genea as race in this passage. In my book, I dedicate an entire chapter to answering the reasons why. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I above all hope that you will be very wary of when you're listening to sermons from people on YouTube on how they approach the scripture, and do they let scripture speak, or do they impose their own ideas onto the text of scripture. These two are two of the most important questions one must ask themselves when listening to any sermon. I hope you enjoyed the video. Step aside, babe. Let a star do this. That's all! That's all, folks! Can I go home now? 